Well, um, let me start off the compliments by think, saying thank you very much, Emily. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I learned a lot and uh, I'm a biologist. I'm kind of on the other end of that spectrum and I was able to keep up. So you did a great job explaining it to somebody who stares at how hairy plants are all day. And I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Sokoloff and I'm a botanist at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, Canada. Um, so we are Canada's National Natural History Museum. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the work that our, our, re our team does uh, exploring the plant biodiversity in Arctic Canada. And so uh, this is our team here. They've all played a really integral part of making this talk happen. So I just wanna start off by saying thank you to all of them for contributing to the collection science and the data and the research that I'm about to go through. All right, so I like to start off most talks by talking about what is the Arctic. And, and most people, when they think of the Arctic, they think of something like this. They think of snow and ice and cold all the time and, you know, more and more, uh, you know, this boat of tourists who are going through the Arctic and, and having a good look at it because Arctic tourism is increasing. Um, and unfortunately, and this might be due to advertising, sometimes people think about penguins. Of course, there are no penguins in the Arctic. This is a penguin fee presentation. We've got that out of the way. Um, and this is true. The Arctic is like this for a large part of the time. Uh, but if you're a botanist like me, you're actually going to the Arctic in the peak of summer. And in the Arctic, that's July, and if you're lucky, August. And it doesn't all look just snow and ice and, and kind of cold and barren. You know, some parts like this in the bottom right do look like it might be on the surface of Mars, uh, but other places are, are more lush, like river valleys, parts of the low Arctic where you get lots of shrubby vegetation. Uh, or uh, if you book in the bottom left, places that look like the prairies, like Saskatchewan, where you can run, watch your dog run away for three days on end. Uh, and I'll stop with the Western Canada jokes now. Um, so if you're a botanist like me, uh, you might define the Arctic as being everything that is above the tree line. Um, and so in Canada, that's 40% of our land mass. That's a little over 2 million square kilometers. And the Arctic Islands alone we have are 1.42 million square kilometers. And that's an enormous part of our country. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of room to cover there if you're a botanist interested in seeing what grows where on the land. Of course, in Canada, uh, you know, the Arctic isn't just the Arctic. It's also synonymous with Inuit Nunangat, which is the Inuit homeland in Canada. This has been the a traditional home of Inuit for thousands of years, time immemorial. And in Canada, it's composed of four separate Inuit regions. We have Nunatsiavut in northern Labrador, Nunavik in northern Quebec, the territory of Nunavut, which was established in 1999, and the Inuvial Inuvialuit settlement region, which is the Arctic part of Northwest Territories. And there's a, there's a large, strong tradition of traditional knowledge when it comes to Arctic plants uh, in Nunavut, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So, uh, you know, now we've got talked about what the Arctic is, I like to talk about what is a botanist. And uh, essentially, um, you know, botanist is somebody who's interested uh, not in arranging plants, that's a florist, um, and this, you know, that's a perfectly valid career path, but that's not what I do. I have to remind my grandparents of this every time I see them. Uh, a botanist is more interested in plant biodiversity, uh, although after about three weeks in the field, I am likely to put a plant on top of my head or two. Um, you know, it's a bit of creative arranging there. Uh, no, what you can often find me doing is looking at plants deeply under a microscope and thinking about how, what they are and what is the identity of this particular plant. Um, so I know a few of you have probably visited our museum, the Canadian Museum of Nature here in Ottawa. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, this is the museum up in the top left. Uh, and uh, we have a bit of a castle. In fact, it was actually designed by a Scottish architect who was uh, um, in Canada helping to design a few buildings in the capital. Uh, I don't work there. I work at our research and collections facility, which is below that, um, where we house over 14 million natural history specimens. And these are objects that we can use to tell the story about the world around us. So what does a botanist do? Well, essentially, I, I, I like to sort things. Um, and this is really good for me because I tend to like to be organized. In fact, it might be a bit of a compulsion of mine. Uh, but what I could do is I could actually, uh, what we do as botanists are we take uh, 
the plant life in the world around us and we sort it. And that's a way of making it manageable and letting us talk to each other about this plant life. Um, so for instance, let's take a look at this one particular uh, group of plants. This is the bean family, the Fabaceae. And I like to pick on the beans uh, because I actually did my master's on beans. And um, well, I mean, I guess that makes me unique in, in many circles, but I'm crazy about beans, so they're wonderful. So all of these uh, images you see here are members of the Fabaceae. This is the bean or the pea family. And if you look at them, you can see, okay, well, they all look like they're related to each other, but many of them look like they're different as well. So we, we have them kind of lumped into this category, this plant family. What we can do is we can refine that family and we can make it, uh, into, you know, go down a little bit more and we say, okay, well, everything that's more closely related to each other than everything else in the rest of the family, we're gonna make that a genus. And we'll call this genus Astragalus, which is actually the one I did my master's on. Uh, and from there, we can further refine and say that, okay, well, within this genus, we have this species, Astragalus bedinia, and here we go back to those Latin binomials you probably learned in school. So what we're saying essentially is that everything that we're naming Astragalus bedinia belongs in one cohesive group together, and it excludes everything else, even though it's a part of that broader hierarchy. So essentially, what I do with my time is I start lumping things into categories. And those are manageable units of biodiversity that we can use for things like conservation science, uh, talking about evolution of different species, um, and often talking to the public about what plants are, because you know, in, in order to uh, know what something is, we have to have the vocabulary to describe it. Uh, and of course, this is just one way of describing plant taxonomy. This is kind of the Western Linnaean method that we use in universities. Uh, however, there are many different ways to talk about the same plant. Uh, so if you look at this plant on the left, uh, I would look at this and say, oh, this is Salix fusescens. Um, and I know that because, well, if you look at these fruits here, they're red and they're not hairy. However, um, you know, uh, an elder in Arviat uh, might look at this and call this ukpik, which is the Inuktut word for this particular willow species there. Or if I'm talking to the general public, I might use the term bog willow because that's a little more approachable than the Latin binomial. Uh, and because this is Canada and we're officially bilingual, I might also call it solfov in French. Um, and that's, you know, those are all wh the way of valid ways of talking about the same plant. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't really care much what name you use for it. If you're talking about a plant, I'm just excited to talk with you about it. All right, so in sorting out all of those individual species that are all cohesive units, we think there are about 800 different plant species across the Canadian Arctic. And uh, this is just one example of plant species here. This is the uh, Micranthes foliolosa, a member of the saxifrage family. Uh, and so those include many different types of species, like this. This is the purple mountain saxifrage, which is the territorial flower of Nunavut. And uh, I will tell you that, you know, if you're looking at my plant photos in this presentation, um, please keep in mind that Arctic plants tend to be about yay big. So uh, my macro lens is my best friend when I'm up in the north. Um, and this one I like to bring out uh, at uh, presentations where people are attending from circumpolar countries because this one occurs across the circumpolar Arctic. And so you'll find this, um, you'll find this in Scotland, you'll find this in Norway, you'll find this in Russia. Um, and it's a common touch point for people when we're talking about Arctic plants. Uh, and of course, we also have, uh, you know, those plants that display excellent adaptation to Arctic environments. Um, so I imagine where most of you live, there are willow species and you know you're probably your typical willow is probably this big tall droopy thing that hangs you know with these big dangling branches well in the arctic you do get willows but the tallest willow tree i've ever seen in the arctic or at least in the high arctic has only been about 10 centimeters tall uh, and that's because uh, Arctic willows, like many other Arctic species, are adapted to grow low to the ground, where uh, you're going to get warmer environments because of the sun rays hitting the earth, uh, but also because essentially you're staying out of the wind. And so this is, a, this is an Arctic forest, or at least this is one tree in an Arctic forest on Somerset Island in Nunavut. So how do we keep track of all of these different plants that we have in the Arctic? And, and you know, how do, we, how do we do research on them if 
you know, I live in Ottawa, which is about 3,000 kilometers away from the nearest uh, point of entry into the Canadian Arctic. Well, we do this using natural history collections, and in our case, a herbarium. Uh, so what's a herbarium? Well, essentially, it's a collection of pressed and dried plants that are, you know, essentially come with a label that says, this particular plant was found at this place at this time. And if any of you have ever in school or in life just pressed a plant in some books, essentially that's what I do for work, except I get paid to do it. So I'm quite happy about that. Um, what we do are we, we press plants using a plant press. And once they're flat and two dimensional, essentially they last hundreds for hundreds of years if we store them in the right conditions. And those are like you see here, cabinets where they're um, kept out of uh, any kind of light um, in a zero humidity environment that's quite cool. Essentially, we're trying to keep these specimens for as long as we can because by accumulating a collection, we don't have to go up to the Arctic every time we have a question about the evolution of an Arctic plant or was a particular plant actually found in this place. We can just go find the specimen next door in our collection room. And so in our herbarium, the National Herbarium of Canada, we have about a million specimens, flattened and dried. And they're all organized by species and by location so that if I wanna figure out, okay, how many of this particular capitata, as you see here, are in the Canadian Arctic, all I have to do is go pull them and to find out. And so by plotting all of those specimens and the coordinates that are recorded on those labels of all of those specimens, you start to get an idea of, okay, how many different collections have been made across the Arctic? And that's what you're seeing here. These are all of the collections made in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. Uh, and, you know, not only, you know, do we have a complete knowledge of, of a particular species, but do we know everything about the regions in the Arctic? And so you can see that some places here have been collected quite a bit. Others have been collected maybe less so. And so those might actually be places where we would be interested in doing field work and going to find out, oh, okay, you know, nobody's collected right here in this southern part of uh, uh, the Broder Peninsula on Baffin Island. Maybe we want to go check it out. Uh, and so that'll kind of drive us how we do our field work. Of course, the, the other half of that is where can we get funding to go and who's going to partner with us to get up to the Arctic because it is quite expensive. And so why are we doing this? Why are we figuring out what are all the Arctic specimens across Canada and, and what are all the different species across Canada? Uh, because we're working on a project to essentially put together a list of every species of vascular plants, so things with roots and shoots, that grow in the Canadian Arctic and, and then put it online as a resource for anybody to use, ecologists, conservationists, people who are doing um, uh, work on environmental impact, uh, and actually this, this website is live right now. You can go visit it after this presentation. This is our Arctic Flora of Canada and Alaska page. Uh, and it's got all sorts of great resources uh, about what kind of plants grow in the Arctic and, and lovely pictures too. So I would encourage you to check it out. So that's what we do and why we're doing it. Uh, and I'm just checking the time. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out, uh, get a complete picture of Arctic plant life across Northern Canada. Um, and of course, we have lots of collections, but we need to build those collections over time too, because we're also looking for change in things over time, not just was a particular plant found there at some point in the past. Uh, and that's where the most fun part of my work comes in. That's Arctic field work. And so pretty much nearly every summer, you can find me getting on a plane here, chartered by the Polar Continental Shelf Program, and heading up uh, somewhere in the Arctic to do plant collecting. And so uh, when we're going out, we're going out to a remote field camp on the land. So we have to make sure we bring everything with us. Uh, so for instance, uh, dehydrated dried food that we might be interested in eating. Um, and that all has to fit into one or two twin otter planes just like this. And so typically we'll have everything we need in under a thousand pounds to go up and do our field work. So we'll assemble our team, and these are just some members of our Arctic Flora research team at the Canadian Museum of Nature. We've got Jennifer Doubt, who's our curator uh, of um, uh, the herbarium, uh, Dr. Lynn Gillespie, uh, Roger Bull, this is myself back after, this is almost 10 years ago, wow, time flies, and Dr. Jeff Sorella. And these are just a few people. Uh, actually, this was my first trip up to the Arctic back in 2010. Uh, but our team has grown since then, and the reason for that uh, is twofold. 
um, A, uh, no institution in their right mind would ever let anybody do remote field work by themselves. And this is an absolutely good idea for safety reasons. Uh, but also everybody brings a different um, uh, expertise to camp, uh, whether that be a different taxonomic group, uh, like uh, working on mosses like Jennifer does, or grasses like Jeff does, or whether we bring a specialty in doing fieldwork logistics, or whether we bring a specialty in, in making sure that camp operations run well, we're better together when we do that work. And that extends past the field season and to our wonderful collections team as well. So uh, in a field camp, what we'll do is we'll get up and, and because this is the Arctic, you know, there is no sunrise or sunset, depending on where we go, because we've got 24 hour sunlight. And we'll typically just go hiking and collecting plants along the way. And so this is a picture of me collecting along the Soper River on Baffin Island in 2012. You might notice that I'm armed, and that is because uh, a large part of the Arctic is polar bear country. And so, in fact, we do have um, firearms as a uh, um, uh, polar bear deterrent. We have things like bear bangers and rubber bullets. Um, certainly when I got my biology degree, I never thought the next thing I'd be getting was my firearms license, but here we are. So after about a week, uh, you know, um, sorry, a full day of out hiking on the land and collecting plants, we'll bring them back to our work tent at our base camp. And then we'll start pressing them, just like I mentioned. Well, uh, here we've got Dr. Jeff Sorella laying out uh, a specimen of sea beach sandwort, Honkinia peploides, on a sheet of newsprint. So what we do are we arrange them on newsprints, we sandwich these plants between cardboards, and we use a plant press, just like the one you see on the right here. Um, this was state-of-the-art technology circa, uh, what, the early 1700s? So, you know, it's like, this is a, one of those, if it's not broken, don't fix it situations. This is definitely a very old way of preserving our plants. Um, however, we also now do preserve small bits of tissue in silica gel, so the things you find in, in a, a, you know, a new backpack or a new pair of shoes, um, for DNA extraction later on. So that's a, a kind of a new modern update on this very old technique. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, in a given field season, we might end up pressing quite a bit. In fact, this is not even the biggest plant press that we have assembled. Um, although I think this is pretty close. And this is at the very end of one of our presentation, uh, one of our, our field seasons where I think we collected about 1400 individual collections for the herbarium over the course of a month. Uh, so I wanna kind of run you through our, our last decade of field work across the Canadian Arctic to give you not only a sense of, of the, the breadth of what we're doing, but also as because we're all cooped up, I think we could all use a bit of a virtual uh, tour of the, you know, kind of a pretty landscape right now. So I'm gonna start off in 2008, and this is a uh, field work that was on Victoria Island in Nunavut, uh, where we had helicopter support from the Polar Continental Shelf Project. And on this very flat part of, of the southern part of Victoria Island, we actually found uh, new records of this particular grass here, Banks Island alkali grass, Puccinellia banksiensis. And, I don't know if you can see this, but for scale, that's a mosquito here. And of course, in the Arctic, the mosquitoes at least seem a lot bigger than they are because there's almost no protection from them. Um, but I'm digressing a little bit. Uh, this Banks Island alkali grass is interesting to us because this is one of the most uh, recently new described species in the Canadian high Arctic. And this was described by Dr. Laurie Consul as part of her PhD thesis back in 2008. Uh, and essentially it was a cryptic species until she found some very small morphological characters coupled with DNA differences that meant that this was a new and unique thing worthy of recognition. Uh, the year after that, we uh, spent some time working in uh, Tutu Nogai National Park in Northwest Territories. Uh, Tutu Nogai is an Inuktuk term for young caribou. This uh, national park was uh, established in part to protect the calving grounds of the blue nosed caribou herd. And while we were on that particular trip, we actually ended up uh, canoeing down the Hornaday River. Um, and this was a, a way of uh, doing a survey of the park while also collecting at the same time. And as part of this fieldwork, our team found some of the most northern stands of balsam poplar, Poplus balsamea, in North America. And this is very important for us to document because one of the, the, the effects that we think we're going to see as a part of climate change is tree line advance. And so documenting these northern extent of the trees is going to be really important to figuring out how far north the tree line will advance in time. 
Uh, 2010 took us back to Victoria Island, uh, to the Northwest Territories side of the island. Uh, and this was actually my first trip with the CMN because this is the first year I, I started working uh, as a full-time employee. For the past two years, I was actually a grad student at the museum. Uh, and so on this particular trip, uh, near this Kujua River, this is a big river on Victoria Island, um, we actually found uh, some beans, some legumes, but I, I clearly have omitted the picture, so I'm going to move on from that. Uh, 2012 took our team to Baffin Island, to the Soper River, uh, and in this particular trip, uh, we didn't get any helicopter support. Uh, so what we decided to do was we we're going to raft down the Soper River, uh, Canadian Heritage River on Baffin Island and collect the whole time. Uh, so this is our team here in a, in a catamaran that was made for us by an outfitter in, in Iqaluit. And uh, I think all of our plant collections are in that maroon bag there. So we're being very careful as we raft down this river. Of course, for any time we wanted to have a bit of fun, um, we made sure to take the bag off and portage it around. Uh, and then we got to actually enjoy ourselves going down some rapids here. Uh, so uh, don't ever let um, anybody tell you that biologists don't know how to have fun. Uh, Fieldwork is a lot of fun and it can be really interesting. So what are the, some of the cool things we found in addition to all of that adventure on that trip? Well, we found some of the first records, no, sorry, the first records for the Northern Bar Orchid, this tiny orchid growing in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. And this is, it's a beautiful little green plant. Uh, it's actually mosquito pollinated. Um, so rather than, uh, you know, another insect, a mosquito pollinates it. And in the literature, it's described as smelling faintly of urine. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking of all those pretty orchids, there are also these other really interesting orchids as well. Um, and of course, we also found uh, interesting ex uh, invasive species in some of the communities. So this is an introduced member of Fox Hill, uh, of the grass uh, family, Fox Hill barley, that we found growing in the, uh, in and around the community of Kimirut. So when we were there, we realized, hey, this is new to the Arctic Islands. Uh, so we made sure to document that so that we can do ongoing monitoring of community of invasive plants in communities. 2013 took our team uh, to uh, Arctic Watch Lodge, which is a wilderness lodge on Somerset Island here. Um, I think this is one of my favorite field seasons because this, the lodge makes a mean cappuccino, which is not something I'm accustomed to in uh, a you know, fieldwork setting, but it was amazing. Uh, and in some of these rich bird cliff colonies around this otherwise fairly barren looking island, there are such lush vegetation that includes new records like Dryba globella, a member of the mustard family, that we found for the first time in this area. And, and you know, if I ever say something is barren, that's absolutely not true at all. Like, this might just look like a lot of rot rock and gravel, but there's an incredible amount of history and biological diversity in these areas that the Arctic is just is stunning, phenomenal. And of course, this is something I get very excited about. Um, 2014 took our team to the northern extent of the tree line in Nunavut. This is on the Coppermine River. And so you're seeing spruce trees for the first time in my presentation here. Uh, and we actually found some wild chives growing in and around a territorial park, Kugluk Park. Uh, so we documented them. This is the first time they'd been found in Nunavut. Uh, and we only, uh, I don't actually, I think we were good. We didn't eat the samples. We just pressed them for posterity. We were, we were behaving ourselves. Uh, 2016 took our team to Arviat, which is on the west coast of Hudson Bay in Nunavut. Um, and this is a place that's actually below the Arctic Circle. So you do get these spectacular sunsets um, as the sun dips below the horizon. And this was also a chance for us to work with, uh, closely with Nunavut Parks. And in fact, we now have an ongoing project with Nunavut Parks that allows us to help document the flora of territorial parks there and work directly training botanists in local communities like my good friend Ruth Keviak here from Arviat, who worked with us for a couple weeks documenting the flora while we were in Arviat. And we also found new northern records there. So, and these are aquatic plants, plants that live in, in small freshwater ponds on the tundra. So some of the new records like northern water star wart. I'm gonna pick up a little here just so I don't go over time. 2017 saw our team bop around different parts of the high Arctic. So Ellesmere Island, uh, Axel Heiberg Island, Cornwallis Island, 
Uh, and this was uh, an opportunity for myself and my colleague, Dr. Troy McMullen, to not only do a vascular plant inventory, but add some lichens to this as well, and get on some pretty interesting planes like this DC3 here at the same time. So in, in parts of the Arctic, like Eureka here, this is the entire community in one shot, in Nunavut, this is a research station, uh, we not only found spectacular landscapes uh, like this, this is actual Hyberg Island, and this is Lake Hazen, at the, almost the very tip of Nunavut. Uh, we found new and interesting records, like range extensions of this small grass, Festuca Adlandiae, which was named after Dr. Sylvia Adland, a pioneering botanist at the Geological Survey of Canada. But also some of the first Canadian Arctic records for lichens, like this fan pelt lichen, Peltidra venosa, first time found in the Canadian High Arctic. Uh, and Acherospora sletcheri, uh, an endemic of the American Southwest deserts that we also found for the first time on Ellesmere Island in Nunavut. And another one, Xanthoria ceridiata, the sugared sunburst lichen. 2017 also saw the museum participate in this Canada C3 expedition, which was a, an expedition that took uh, scientists, um, members of communities, artists from around Canada and brought them on a 150 day voyage across uh, all three coasts of Canada. And the whole time people were there, they were also collecting algae, lichens, moss for the herbarium. And our most recent trip took us to Sylvia Grinnell Territorial Park, just outside of Iqaluit, Nunavut, uh, where we were working again with Nunavut Parks to do a bit of a survey of the vegetation there. And this is Dr. Jeff Sorella holding Rhododendron Laponicum, a beautiful native rhododendron in Iqaluit. So all over, in over 10 years of working, we've added over 8,000 new collections from all of these places to the National Herbarium of Canada, and through exchange programs, duplicates around the world. And each one of these trips brings us just a little closer to understanding the complete picture of vascular plant biodiversity in the Canadian Arctic. So if you wanna kind of follow along, I not only mentioned the Arctic Flora website, uh, but just last month, we actually had a new paper come out, The Vascular Flora of Victoria Island, in which we look at 288 taxa on this uh, large Arctic island based on our examination of 7,000 herbarium specimens. So it's, it's open access. I encourage you to check it out. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it was a labor of love for a lot of us here at the museum. So uh, I think that was about it. I'd like to thank everyone for your attention today. Um, I'd like to thank the communities that we've worked in, our funding agencies, and of course, all of our wonderful people who contributed photos and work to this project. And I think that is it for me. Thank you very much for paying attention.